Um, thank you for coming. I just wanted to take a moment to um, introduce a couple of other people uh, that are here. Allison Dieter is a uh, staunch anti-death penalty um, incredible person. Bob and Jean Van Steenberg and Lumen, who is uh, handling our students against the death penalty, and of course, Christina Lawson, um, also her husband was executed on death row, and we all worked closely together over the last eight years that I've been involved since my brother went to death row. Welcome to the baby, and don't worry, it makes sense, for she doesn't work to tell him to. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. I prepared um, this speech and I sent it to my sister and she wrote back a scathing note to me um, to take out some of the graphic things and some of the things that were not very nice uh, about the system. So if you hear me take a quick breath, uh, I'm, I'm going to have to modify it a little bit. Um, thank you so much for being here today at the National Democratic Convention. I'm very proud and honored to be here. My name is Delia Perez Meyer. I have an innocent brother on death row. After many years of dealing with my brother's situation, I have found that it is imperative that we think hard and dig deep into our hearts and our minds and our souls to do what is right and that is to abolish the death penalty. We know that it is a broken, archaic, and a revengeful system. From the law, from the law enforcement agencies to the judicial system, prosecuting attorneys to the jury, all the way up the chain of command to the appellate courts, our governor, and those men and women that ultimately make these decisions in our legislature and our Congress. It is our duty, it is our right, and it is our decision as constituents and humanitarians to step up to the plate now, to be brave, and to be forceful, and to speak out, and to educate, and to change the system. Life is no longer precious. There is no longer the sanctity of life as we once knew it. We live in a culture of death, and we have become immune to it. Our children see it every day as they watch videos and play games and movies, television, war, terrorism, the games, and down to our own family violence that sadly ends in death too often. Also, I think it's important to look at the history of the death penalty, and it does go back thousands of years. We have to consider our own values and morals and put back into place the ones that are good and right. My brothers and sister and I were raised in a very strict Catholic family. We were taught not to lie, cheat, steal, or kill, period. It's that simple. Those were the values of love and faith and conviction and honor that we grew up with. My parents were perfect examples of a good Christian value. They taught us tolerance and forgiveness and compassion. However, we never, ever once contemplated discussed or considered the death penalty until it touched our lives eight years ago. I have found it's very interesting that all religions and cultures around the world have these basic values to be good citizens. And I've traveled, I've been very fortunate to travel a little bit around the world, and I see people at every walk of life, and it's been very inspiring to me that there is goodness in everyone. <coughs> But I recently attended a couple of death penalty conferences, one with uh, Bob and, and uh, the Texas Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty, where the clergymen and priests and rabbis <coughs> spoke about the death penalty. And every single one of them was in essence against the death penalty, except in the worst cases. <laughs> and I think that that's what has shocked me the most. That no one can really or no one has definitely, totally taken a stand against the death penalty in all its forms, in all cases, that no one has been able to say that. I believe there is one, there are 125 people who have recently been released from death rows because of DNA errors. And we have proven 
that many of them were innocent and um, <coughs> it is just uh, phenomenal to know that. But hundreds of men and women have been executed recently as this death machine continues to grind fast and furiously in Texas. And around the world. We see it every day. We saw it yesterday in Iraq, in the Middle East. It's perfect examples of how this was a death penalty. And how many thousands of our innocent brave children in the armed forces have been killed, or worse, have killed other innocent men, women, and children. And it's kind that we put a stop to it now. My brother's son, Joshua, serves in the Army. He is a very brave and valiant soldier, and he left yesterday for another tour to Iraq. I pray that he makes it home again safely. Lewis has four precious children and two even more precious grandchildren, and they all want to know when Grandpa, Big Grandpa, is going to come home and take them fishing. You tried explaining that to a little kid. My little brother, Lewis Castro Perez, has been a victim of our harsh, our racist and an unrelenting judicial system. He was wrongfully convicted of killing three of his best friends in Austin in September of 98. Our friends Michelle, Cinda, and Stacy, and may they rest in peace. Lewis loved those girls with a passion. They were his buddy, lover, his companions. My brother did not commit murder. He was simply at the wrong place <coughs> at the wrong time. And that sounds so cliche. That's exactly what happened when he fell prey to this overzealous law enforcement agency, a vengeful district attorney office, complacent <laughs> jurors, and our misguided death penalty system. In the past eight years that Lewis has been on death row, he has suffered immensely. He broke his leg and they gave him Tylenol. He has witnessed the brutality of all of the officers that come in and will beat up the inmates until they can no longer walk, or spraying them with harsh chemicals, where they all get saturated with this putrid, suffocating, vomit-inducing poisons. They're in a cell that's six feet by six feet with only a cot and a toilet. And my brother is over six feet tall, so I can only imagine what it's like for him, but he has never once complained. He is locked. <laughs> Come on, just one second. <clears throat> he is locked in a metal and concrete box <clears throat> that he says it's like a dog pound in Austin when we used to go get our puppies. <laughs> and those dogs were waiting to be euthanized and in a much more humane manner than he is. They are fed their breakfast at 2 o'clock in the morning. 2 o'clock in the morning. Get up and you get your breakfast. Their lunch is at 10 and their dinner is at 3. This is food that is given to death penalty inmates that is mush. It is dog food filler. It's gross, it's disgusting, it's punishy food. They do not get any fruits or vegetables ever no fresh water, and no meats other than canned pork. I went to visit him the day before yesterday, before I came here, and he was thrilled to announce that he got the butt of a watermelon. And they shoved it, and they tried so hard to shove it through that little hole, but he got it through there. And I could have just cried all day long, but I didn't. I sucked it in, and I reveled in his happiness with him. We are not looking forward to this hurricane season because last year, when Hurricane Katrina came through, the men, the men on death row were abandoned for five days without food and water, and they were stuck in these cages of water up to their knees, suffocating from the 110 degrees, and not knowing if they would survive. But they did, all of them, and I am very grateful. Fighting for my brother on death row has been like butting my head against a brick wall. Nobody wants to listen. Nobody wants to take responsibility for the errors that they made in this case. They say that over 150 people will touch a death penalty case. So for a very long eight years, 
I have written letters and phone calls and signed petitions and called the state <coughs> reps, the governor, I called the FBI, the DP, the DPS, the sheriff, the police, the judges, and not one person has ever called me back. But in the background, thank God, I have joined these anti-death penalty groups that have given me so much love and support that I need to continue fighting for my innocent brother, and I will never stop. Not just for Louis' <coughs> sake, but for the other 400 men that we have, and women that we have on death row. <coughs> In addition, uh, the Catholic Church and the, our bishop, uh, Gregory Aiton, and there are people all over the world that are praying for my <coughs> brother, and that lifts his heart every day, and we are so grateful to them, and words can never express how grateful we are to everyone that has thought about Louis and prayed for him and sent him encouraging cards and notes. The death penalty affects so many people, and um, it's, it's just amazing how complex it is. In our particular case, you may have heard of the railroad serial killer named Angel Macarino Resendiz. He has confessed to killing my brother's girlfriend. And this is the part that I have to skip, but he did bludgeon them all to death. All three girls were bludgeoned to death. Angel is scheduled for execution on June the 27th, and I think that we should all be horrified because he says that he has killed 30 to 40 people that nobody knows about yet. And even if that's not an accurate number, even if it's just a few people that he's killed, I think that we should do what we can to stop his execution. I believe that my brother is not the only man on death row with crimes that I <coughs> has committed. And if he him on June the 27th, he will take to his grave all of those secrets. About one year ago, my family and I went to the district attorney's office, Ronnie Earl, in Austin, Texas. <coughs> and we let him know that Angel had confessed to one of our private investigators and that my brother was innocent and continued to proclaim his innocence. <coughs> And about one year later, they made the announcement recently that they would indeed go back and open his case and check the foreign DNA and check the foreign fingerprints. That was about three months ago, <coughs> and we are waiting on pins, sitting on pins and needles, just waiting for the results. We hope and pray that they're not going to hide evidence and withhold evidence, shove evidence under the rug again. <coughs> We are extremely grateful to them, and we know that it's a very unusual and a difficult move for them, almost unprecedented, but it is the right thing to do, and it restored a little bit of our faith <coughs> in this system. We're not exactly sure what made them go back and open up this case, but I just assume that it's just the pressure from everyone that, um, you know, we all know that there are errors being made, especially in our DNA labs in Houston, so we have a Houston. And that's not just in Houston, it's all over Texas. <coughs> but we do want to say thank you, and my brother always wants to thank everybody that has worked on his case and that has prayed for him and written him letters of support. And as we wait for the district attorney's final determination on the DNA, we just continue to be extremely prayerful and hopeful. And, and uh, the judge in Lewis's case said that if they do come back and match the DNA to Angel Macarino, that my brother would be released the following day. To hope for. We know that if they do their work with honesty and integrity this time, that they will come up with a match and that my little brother will be exonerated and that he will get to come home. This is not the first time that Texas made a mistake and has to go back. We had problems with our yogurt shop murders, our Pizza Hut, Pizza Hut murder, and two people were recently released, Christopher Ochoa and Richard Danzinger. It's been a couple of years now. Scott, how many? 2001. But there are others on death row that are proclaiming their innocence and fighting really hard. <coughs> you may have heard about some of these cases, Rodney Reed, Derek Frazier, Tony Ford, and a new one that, that I've been trying to help, uh, William Wyatt, uh, also innocent and scheduled for execution on August the 3rd. And then of course, uh, Ruben Cantu, and uh, may God rest his soul as well. He was innocent, he always proclaimed <coughs> his innocence. And they went on ahead and killed him anyway, and then recently found out that it was a terrible mistake. For the ones that really did commit their crimes and have already been executed, may they also rest in peace. 
And there have been hundreds of them, including Christina's husband, David. And I say to Christina that I am sorry that we are so blessed. Please forgive us and we'll try desperately not to execute again. <laughs> we are making a little bit of progress. We are taking little tiny steps forward. Many of our cases have recently been remanded back to the states, have been reversed or otherwise questioned. We are making some progress, but it's not enough, and it's certainly not fast enough. We have many executions scheduled over the next few months. <clears throat> I strongly believe in having a world and to the simple. And shut it, shut it, bro. The conditions are so sweet, so humane, and so I hope we make a good decision to help Democrats get back into power. All the Republicans and friends of prisoners who need to get back in. Please take action. All there are many Republicans are working so hard, and I can list them to start the moratorium network, the National Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty, the Texas Coalition to Abolish the Death Penalty, and the Campaign to End the Death Penalty, and then Amnesty International. They are all on the internet, and we are waiting for you. And also, I want to invite all of you, please, to come to Austin for our 8th annual, 7th annual <coughs> death penalty, anti-death penalty march in Austin. And we are tentatively scheduled for October, October the 14th. We would love to have you in Austin to join us. And in addition, Amnesty International has their Faith in Action Weekend where you can <coughs> ask your pastor or your priest or otherwise if you can get involved and get your church involved and just open the dialogue, just start talking about the death penalty. And that will be held over the weekend of the 21st and the 22nd. Thank you very much for being here and for listening. God bless you. Thanks. I'd like to, <clears throat> my name is Dwayne Olney, I'm the county chair from Washington County, yeah. and I, I, I attended this because I have a, a very distinct interest in, in the death penalty situation. Mm -hmm. It so happens my wife and I are private investigators, and we do mostly capital murder cases. Cool. You, yep, mentioned, <laughs> you mentioned two cases, and then just, that, uh, I thought I'd mention one was rescinded. Yes. We want a, uh, a an acquittal in Montgomery County because of the DNA evidence that was found in the hands of the victim that matched the sentence here. Oh, so bad to hear that. Okay, so we so there were two two defendants, so we both of them work with. It. Wonderful. Yeah. The, Reed, the Reed case you mentioned. Yes. Uh, I was also an investigator on that case. Oh my God. Okay, and then another case that we got kicked back last year was about a hockey case in the Atascosa ambush case. We got that one kicked back. But I would like to say something about the approach that y'all take. Okay. <clears throat> I've worked some with the people in Houston and with uh, a group out of Naples, Italy, the Coalition Against the Death Penalty. Yes. As a matter of fact, my wife and I were there in 2002 meeting with that coalition trying to get them to understand how, quote, to sell your argument. Yes. And every time that I see uh, material put out, it has the stories of the inmates in there. Now, I also retired from TDC, okay? So I, I have two different perspectives yes. on this whole yes. thing. But the stories of the inmates does not sell, it doesn't sell here in Texas, and it never will sell, okay? It mm -hmm. won't happen, okay? Now, what people have to understand, now you mentioned the defense attorneys. Now I worked for like 14 different attorneys. I've only had the occasion to dump one of those attorneys due to what I consider the incompetence. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you, these attorneys put in a heck of a lot of time. Now in the Reed case, in my case, where I was a paid investigator, I get paid by the court, okay? <laughs> for the writ, in Rodney's writ, okay, which Excuse me. Sure. <laughs> Might be Rodney's mom now. <laughs> uh, in Rodney's case, during the uh, the writ of habeas corpus that goes through the Court of Criminal Appeals, when you do a writ of habeas corpus, you have to start all over right. from square one doing the investigation. I mean, from square one. Okay? 
The limit that the Court of Criminal Appeals puts on an investigator is $4,500. Okay? That was eight years ago. And I've been working on that case off and on since then. Okay? So I long ago used up that $4,500. Okay? Now I have two, I have two uh, choices. I could walk away from the case and leave my attorney swinging in the breeze, <laughs> or I keep working pro bono. And I have three cases that are, uh, that are <coughs> at least a minimum of eight years old at this present time, okay? What you people need to realize is, and where you're missing the boat is, you're not fighting back on the economic issue. Mm -hmm. And when I'm talking about the economics, I don't know if all of you realize it or not, but the county where the crime was committed is the county that pays the tab. Right. Okay? And let me tell you something. You go to the rural county, you have a very unequal death penalty situation now. Because you go to Harris County, they have millions to prosecute. I had a case in, in, a, in Central Texas County here. Two defendants, four victims, two of which were children. There's enough <coughs> anomalies to even get started that they decided they wanted to plea it out. And we pl pled it out for a life sentence. And in the paper, even the DA said, it worked out best for us because it would have cost us $700,000. They are not prosecuting in smaller counties. So you have this inequality right. in there right now, that it, and, and that is a serious problem. And I don't see why the ACLU or somebody hasn't challenged the death penalty just on that basis alone. And what you're failing to look at is the ECO aren't going to sell. Sorry, it is. The average person in Texas is going to pick that up and read that story and right. say, that's BS. Right. Okay. I, I, think right. we have, I believe, and we can speak to this, maybe, I think we have the, the economic aspect. And the it's, it's the most important thing, but I have to agree with you about the public defender's situation a little bit, because <coughs> most, most of the attorneys I work with only handle but one criminal court, one capital right. case a year because of, <coughs> number one, it's Sorry. expensive for them, and number two, it's, it's a drain. I think my point was that we should have one central office so that they would pay the committee more well, and fund the investigations more. Where, so but that's a legislative function. That has nothing to do with the attorney. And the attorneys now, they, you can't, you don't get an attorney just off the street and say, well, you're assigned this case. There, there are, uh, uh, rules that they have to follow. They have to sit second chair for so many cases, and then they have to do so many appeals and all of this before they qualify as uh, first chair in a, in a capital case. So, and, and the attorneys that I work for are very diligent about it. But yeah, there are mistakes. One of the big problems we have in the Reed case, for instance, is we need to hop on the legislature and these judges, because in Reed's case, you know what they're doing as well as I do, the, the Attorney General's office is out there to preserve a conviction. Right. That's the only thing that's wrong. <coughs> and every, I've, this last year I had three cases kicked back. Overall, in the last <coughs> 10 years, I kept seven people off death row. Thank you very much. So, but I'm telling you that you're selling it the wrong way. And I'm not trying to be critical. My name is Christina Lawson, and the death